Tight, tight, tight Just tell us where the title is. Yes. So we are we are getting there in a sec. Is it so before it, it's actually Canada. Um, Carleton College. Yeah. So my new and improved title is Against the Hegemony of the Vocabulary of the Moral Right to Collective Self-Determination, and that's actually the short title. The full title is that in practical reasoning about territorial conflict. So before we begin, what I'd like to do, and I was hoping kind of that Tamar would be here, but you can tell her that. Um, I wanted to get it off my chest. This project has been in the making for a long, long time. And one of the reasons why it, it, it took me so long to turn my PhD manuscript into a book, it's actually Tamar's fault. So already in my PhD, I like to think that I had a an interesting take on self-determination, a critique of self-determination, and then, and then Tamar published her book in 2005, or was it 2006? And it kind of completely ruined my, my game. And it, it, it's as if the situation was, no, not in that direction, wait, no, no, please, wait, no. Particularity requirement is not that important. So I've been trying in you know, pursuing this project, sorry, we need to go back, um, to, to offer a conceptual critique of self-determination that comes up with an alternative, but which is also at the same time capable of responding or making sense of this alternative without obsessing about the particularity requirement. So um, before I begin and before I before I tell you what that alternative is and that will unfold in the, in the course of the presentation, uh, let me tell you what this against the hegemony is not. So this is not an intradisciplinary critique from within the field of normative theory. So I'm not critiquing what I call the hegemony of the vocabulary of our moral right to collective self-determination from the perspective of democratic theory, all affected interest principle, or all subjected interest principle, and and stuff like that. I'm not critiquing it from the perspective of individual theories of territorial rights, such as those of Harry Barron and Hill Steiner, within the field of normative theory. I'm also not um, critiquing what I call the hegemony of uh, moral, the vocabulary of self-determination in practical reasoning about territorial conflict from the perspective of joint world ownership or cosmopolitanism or global constitution, so I'm not doing that. I'm also not um, putting forward my argument from the perspective of, of outside of the field of normative theory. So I mentioned earlier um, Rogers Brubaker, so while I agree with Brubaker um, in the sense that I find his diagnosis of the problems with, conceptual problems with the idea of nationhood compelling, I'm not, I'm not following him in his open-ended um, call to expand the scope of our political imagination without at the same time providing criteria for the, for the resolution of the territorial conflict. So I like to think that I'm doing both. So engaging in a radical critique of the vocabulary of self-determination, but at the same time not giving up on the ambition to actually provide some um, principles, if you will, that, that serve the purpose of the vocabulary of self-determination. And why I do that, hopefully it will become also obvious um, in the course of the discussion. Thirdly, that critique, my critique, is not indiscriminate. So I, I completely subscribe to uh, Feinberg's uh, argument from 1970 about the value and essence of rights. So um, they are a particularly sturdy piece of moral furniture. They make us feel or you know, turn us or enable our antagonists and ourselves to think of ourselves as um, agents with moral dignity that have to be taken seriously. So th there is value in that. There is, there is value in arguing territorial conflict through the lens of territorial rights and rights to self-determination in certain particular context. What I am against is the indiscriminate nature 
in which vocabularies of self-determination of territorial rights um, are presenting themselves. So Margaret Moore wrote a book, The Political Theory of Territory. She didn't write political theory of territory with a special um, focus on Canada and whatever normative theorist's mind's eye is on, or on Israel, or in David Miller's case, Western Europe, England, and so on and so forth. Finally, um, my critique doesn't come from nowhere. It's a politically inspired critique. Um, what I want to achieve on the political front is open, open the possibility for arguing about spatial strategies of political struggle outside of the register of liberal theory. So to put it in a, in a very kind of quippy, summarily way, good luck justifying occupations, factory repossessions, um, provocative secessions that don't mean seriously from within the vocabulary of liberal theory of territorial rights. So that's, that's simply impossible. If you are interested in the, those, those cases, then go and hang out with critical geographers and radical Democrats, but don't pretend that this is a matter of, of normative justification. And I have a problem with that, and I don't see a reason why would that be the case. Now, again, in a couple of minutes, I will suggest what, in my mind, is an alternative way to reimagine, and when I say reimagine, I mean it quite literally, visually reimagine the vocabulary of self-determination. But before that, let me just say very briefly, and I will return to that in the end, what are the problems with the vocabulary of liberal theory or normative theory in general of the rights to self-determination and territorial rights in general? Number one. You, you can't escape performative contradiction. If you are talking about moral rights, collective moral rights to territory, sooner or later you will encounter a performative contradiction, which should at least, at the very least, give normative theorists a bit of a pause when they argue and develop models of, of uh, rights of self-determination and territorial rights. But, but, um, that's a minor point and I'm using this as a point of entry because um, I like to think that this project is not about finding gotcha moments. Ha <laughs> ha, performative contradiction, I got you, I win, you lose because you're not making sense. I, I prefer to think of those performative contradictions as symptoms. So if normative theorists are so willing to ignore what to my mind are performative contradictions, that to me is a symptom that they care about something very, very much to be able to turn those contradictions into blind spots. Secondly, and I will just enumerate them and move on, they're underdetermined and more than they admit. So a self-aware normative theorist will tell you, yeah, but of course moral rights to territory are not trumps. Of course, they're prima facie rights, and then if you're David Miller, you are going to even dilute it even more. They're not even rights, they're good claims. And in Tommy's case, we talk about territorial rights, but when push comes to shove, they're principles, right? They're principles, they're good claims. They're good claims, so no, 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 don't get, don't get me wrong. Of course, they're underdetermined. We balance them, the principle, et cetera, et cetera. All of which is fine, and I don't have an issue with it, but there is another layer of, of kind of complication that none of these, in my mind, theories admit. C, they don't work when they should. So, and I'll get to that in the end, Ukraine, Donbass, who is, who, is, who is the enduring group there in the situation where those identities are in flux? In Montenegro, where they ch keep changing their mind about their national uh, identification every, every 25 years. So either they have to remain silent on, on, the, on the moral import of what they're saying, or, or there is a blind spot that they should openly acknowledge. Namely, they make more sense in Israel, and they make no sense or less sense in the Balkans. C, D, they're not as useful as they profess. So again, self-aware normative, Margaret Moore, David Miller, we're not saying that vocabulary of, of moral rights can do everything. We're just saying that it can usefully help us determine the hinterlands or inland, the heartland of, the, of, of, uh, of a nation's rightful land or the kind of the solid core 
of the rightful claim to, to land. My rhetorical question, and I'll return to that as well, when was a territorial conflict ever conducted about heartlands? Very, very rarely in Israel it did, and from that point of view makes, makes perfect. But, so, I'll, I'll get back to that in the end, but at, at this point, just a brief foreshadowing, there are so many more elegant ways, simple, epistemically non-taxing, to do the exact same thing without, so, we can apply Occam's razor here in 80% of the cases around the world. We don't need this, this accoutrement of, of sophisticated theories. And then the question is, well, if we don't, why should we? E, they're silent on adverse effects. And what I mean by that, I will leave until the end. Before I move on to clarify the terminology or to clarify my understanding of what moral rights to territory are, or moral rights to self-determination, they basically have a structure that mimics social imaginary of people on the ground, but it's more self-aware again, more sophisticated, and more and more um, you know crystallizes these moral intuitions. So here, and we don't need to make much of it. This is just an example. This is from Margaret Moore's recent book on political political theory of the territory, and the reason why I'm putting it here because she's very care she's very careful to be careful about what she means by the people, about what she means by territorial rights, about the internal architecture of territorial rights. So it's kind of fun and useful and you know, she's a good sparring partner to critique precisely because of these, um, the, the care that she puts in, into developing her argument. The, the general structure is very simple. We identify the people, we look whether they have territorial right or not. So here, the, the illustration looks more Millerian, right? There, the, something happened with the land. So, you know, they may, might have improved the land, they might have sang about the land, they, they may have had rights of residency that then culminated and, and kind of coagulated to form rights of occupancy as with um, Moore. It doesn't matter, it's important that you have a territorial right and then countervailing considerations come into play. Maybe there is another group that has territorial rights. So then, then you put, start putting stuff in the pot, right? Um, are there other groups that have territorial rights? What are the requirements of justice? And so on and so forth. Then we balance things. And this is the best case scenario, main prize. If there are no such countervailing considerations, ta-da, you, 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 you get territorial sovereignty and you become a state. Now, before we talk about uh, performative contradictions, I would ask you, so I, I think it's important for me to come clean and say, okay, fine, so what is the alternative? And by way of introduction, I would invite you to think of a, you know, to engage in this mental experiment. I imagine a bizarre world where instead of rights to self-determination, new territorial polities are formed if 10% of the left-handed population of a state petitions the government to start the process of state formation, which at that point, the government convenes the assembly of all the red-haired, ginger-haired indiv individuals, who then, through a majority vote, decide that a new state will be formed, after which, the state central computer um, randomly uh, creates boundaries of new states that conform to the FIFA's ball, soccer ball from 1978, and decides that there will be no more than 15 and no less than 10 new states, and then ta-da, you know, new states are formed. So hopefully this overindulgence pays off if hopefully, at the point when I invite you now to think what is it that all the imaginable, all the imaginable theoretical accounts of self-determination and all the imaginable juridical accounts of self-determination, ethnos, demos, uti uh, 
self-determination all but the name. South Sudan, Brexit, the secession of the independence of, of, um, of Scotland, um, the autonomy for Serbian enclaves in Kosovo. So what do all theoretical accounts of self-determination, what do all juridical accounts of self-determination taken together have in common against this bizarro world that I have just um, painted for you. So you could say, well, which includes the individual rights to self-determination, a la Steiner and Baron and so on and so forth. So you could say, well, um, in this case, the self-determination serves the purposes of a group. So it kind of contributes to certain groups flourishing. Well, I could say it's, it serves the flourishing of a of the ginger-haired constituency and the left-handed minorities within the state. Um, and, you know, I, I can't or I might anticipate what your answers and objections will be, and I'm sure this will crop up in the, in the Q&A period, so I'll, I'll, so I'll just say it. What they share and what's absent, in my mind, from the debates about self-determination, both in jurisprudence and the normative theory, is that the aggregate degree of satisfied constituent allegiances or attachments or the identifications with the state in which individuals end up in goes up. So you could say, ha ha, you are, you're a consequentialist. We knew it. So this is some sort of a consequentialist argument. You could interpret it this way, but keep in mind that this is not my project, this is not my intention. My intention is to find a way or to show how the deontological account of self-determination that operates with collectivities and so-called collectivities and their so-called rights and their so-called um, territories, how it can be re-described in a way without these devices. So, at the very end, I will show why would I ever want to do that. But I want to suggest before we move on, actually, so in other, in other, in other words, if you wanted me to summarize what is this thing that I am describing, another way to think of a, the right to self-determination is that it's an algorithm. It's an algorithm, it's a protocol that says if X, then Y, and if A, B, C, then one, two, three. So the so-called collectivities, they have so-called right to self-determination. You can think of it as a protocol that selects a certain, men certain mental states from whatever field of struggle there is, and based on the protocol, based on the al concrete algorithm within, within each individual account of self-determination, decide when shall, when shall we trigger the process of polity formation? How should we draw the boundaries? How should we decide on the status? And what should be, what are the side constraints on constitution making in, within the new state and or, and or in the context of a wider state? So from that point of view, both the ginger-haired bizarro universe and all the other accounts of self-determination are just different algorithms. So whether that's useful, whether that's productive, I leave aside and we can, we can talk about it, but I think that's a, that's, that's a plausible interpretation of self, what self-determination is. If you're super persuaded by Feinberg's argument, and if you think, oh my God, nobody will ever take us seriously if we don't claim the right to self-determination, well then obviously you won't find this attractive, but then I would argue that's a political judgment call that you are entitled to make, and again, I would be happy if you would you know, uh, agree that that's a contextual judgment call that should be made from, a, from, a, from, from one arena of struggle in, you know, depending on, on time and different times and spaces. Um, so what's N? So N, well, I mean, I, I cut and paste. So the N, I call it in the book. So there is demos, there is, uh, there is ethnos, and I call it nephos, which is an ancient Greek for a cloud. 
So like in a cloud, there are different particles that have different valences and depending on an algorithm, so I'm getting ahead of myself, you take the particular mental states that interest you and make them do the work um, that, that, that your algorithm wants, want, wants you to do or you know, that you want your algorithm to, to do. And I can give examples maybe, maybe later. But what I want to say, so I think theorists are more successful at critiquing other people's arguments than defending their own, so I'll just, you know, just um, set this aside. When you look at Moore's definition of the people, when you give it a second look, that's no community. It's just a metaphor. Nobody's doing self-determining here. It's a set. It's a set. It's a set of members that fulfill criteria. So even when they talk about identities and communities, when they model in theory the right to self-determination, nobody is self-determining. Similar thing with Miller. But I, I, chose, I chose more because it's blatantly obvious, right? What needs to happen, how do you call this, this sign in, in math? The, 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 when there is an overlap of, of, of sets. Anyway, so these are the criteria that have to conjunctively apply in order for us to, to, to identify a claim coming from within this set as rightfully triggering the process of polity formation. We just happen to call it a collective or a community or a group. So maybe they think they're not anthropomorphizing, but they're not, they're not, at least in Moore's case, they're not serious about, about groups doing anything. Um, this still leaves me with a problem of a territorial right and um, how am I able then to speak to awful situations where you know, the snapshot of, of a territory has changed because of some sort of a morally reprehensible uh, past action? So I'll, I'll, I'll get to that too. So um, circularity and transubstantiation. So these are the two performative paradoxes. So I won't, I couldn't find chicken and the egg dilemma looked, didn't look very distinguished, distinguished, so I decided to have Euroboros, the ancient mythological creature that constitutes itself. And for me, um, and I won't spend too much time on this, this is an apt description of the status theories of, of territorial rights and self-determination a la Anastas. So, so for me it's obvious and maybe we will disagree, it's blatantly circular. And in Stiltz's argument has undergone a number of changes over the last year, several years. She has tweaked her account of self-determination. She first deliberately attributed it to the territorial people. Then she changed and said that the meta-jurisdictional territorial right belongs to the legitimate state. In, in a nutshell, boils down to the same thing. There is no escape from circularity. The state, the spatial extent of the existing state constitutes the people, its spatiotemporal identity, and then that people, according to her, has the residual right to restore the territorial integrity of the state in case that state is being unjustly dismembered. So this is a simplification, but I think ultimately an accurate one. Um, the problem is, well, where did you get that residual right from? If, if your very existence is, is you know, justified in a circular way. This, I couldn't find the Catholic priest giving the host, how do you call it in English? Host? Yeah. Communion, where the pre-political communion of an ethnic nation magically transforms itself into the body of Christ of a territorial people after the moment of, after, after, at the very moment at which the pre-political community gets its wishes satisfied. So in order for the butterfly to consume, consummate their right to self-determination, the caterpillar, caterpillar has to die. And in this case, we can kind of see the genetic similarity, but from a conceptual point of view, ethnic nation that wants it and the territorial people that gets it are conceptually two different agents. And for some magical reason, 
caveat. You could, at that point, bite the bullet and say, like in Israel or in Malaysia, well, you know, so, so what? Actually, the, 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 the bearer survives, and it continues to be the bearer of the right to self-determination. Jewish people wanted it, Jewish people got it, and we are, we are the masters in our own house, and it is us who, who, who continue to maintain the meta-jurisdictional uh, territorial right. Most, to my knowledge, normative theorists of a non-state is bent, don't bite that bullet, and instead the, the bearer of the soul determination magically transforms itself. Why? And here we come to, to the point I made in the introduction. Um, this in and of itself is no reason to dismiss or even critique normative rights to self-determination or liberal normative theories of, of territorial rights. Because to me, this is more of a symptom of certain things that normative theorists worry about, are anxious about, uh, hold dear, that they simply can't deal with them explicitly, and that the symptom of the suppression of these ideals and anxieties crops up as a performative contradiction. So for example, if you didn't, one of the reasons why you would want to fake that there are no logical problems is because you want to make sure that the new polity that ended up being created will preserve its spatio-temporal integrity over time, that the dissatisfied individuals won't say, hang on a minute, I've, I've been uh, included in this polity against my will. You have progressively re-aggregated in a wrong way. I would want to continue to kind of, you know, have one additional spin at the merry-go-round and fine-tune the boundaries even more. So in order for that not to happen, we invent the spatiotemporal continuity of those collective agents that, for all intents and purposes, don't exist. And they don't exist even in the terms, as I just showed in the context of Miller, uh, Moore's argument, they don't exist even textually in the context of their own arguments. They're not communities, they're sets. Secondly, oh my god, how will you, how will you justify democratic self-government? So we need this idea, and I'm draw obviously drawing inspiration from Bernard Yack, and he's the first one who forcefully made that argument, a version of it. We, we need to fake this idea that there is a collective agent that's engaged in the process of self-constitution, or constitu sorry, constitution, so that we could continue saying all of this is one big process, ongoing process where individuals take part in collective self-determination. One lateral point, and I'm not going to get into this, there is a strange obsession with shared intentions and joint action in normative political theory. That's a gross oversimplification. It, if taken seriously, it would uh, create gross um, counterintuitive effects. And it's simply, simply put to go to the questions posed in the previous panel, it would disenfranchise all of those whose identities, whose process of identification um, was such that they never felt that they want to participate in, that they had any shared intentions, were engaging in joint action, but who might have this fluctuating sense of national identity, who may even be citizens, but according to Moore's criteria or to the, according to the criteria of other theorists, you know, they would, they would be rendered invisible. And I mean, that's a political problem, that's a, that's a conceptual problem as well. Which brings me to the third point, which is intimately related. We want, normative theorists want, to make the losers feel good. So by, by concealing the fact that every territorial polity, by ex hypothesi, by definition, is over-inclusive, that there, are go there is going to be losers who will then, you know, be in a liberal polity, be treated with equal concern and respect. That, for some reason, is not enough for normative theories of, of, of uh, self-determination territorial rights, because there must not be losers. 
Therefore, that's the result why we create ex post the territorial people that never existed and wanted self-determination in, in the first place. Margaret has, uh, in her book, kind of seeks to preempt that conclusion. I think it's, it's, it's wrong, but you know, I'll, leave it, I'll leave it aside. And then finally, normative theorists operate with an outdated software inherited from constitutional theory, which is, which says, that the ultimate authority in a polity, the, the authority of a constitution must be founded, must be founded in an act of constitution, must be founded in a social contract, in any event that it must be founded. So the problem here is that we can mix and match. We don't need to run Windows 95 when we think about um, seeking or thinking about principled ways how to solve territorial conflict. You can be a constitutional pluralist, you can be a para-constitutionalist, you can be, so there is a lot of software pack, authority software packages on offer, and I think normative theorists are fixated on, on this classical, classical one. Now, um, let me move on to the theories of territorial rights. So again, from the outset, there is probably plenty of good reasons, contingent reasons, to continue using vocabulary of territorial rights, in particular conflicts, for all sorts of reasons. However, um, the very idea of a place, like the very idea of a community, is a heuristic. It's a heuristic that relies on a simplistic account of space. And I wanted to talk a lot about critical geographers and the way in which they con conceptualize the space as a, as a product of relations and socially constituted and so on and so forth. But I will skip that. I will just focus, and I think that's more entertaining, actually, to talk about Margaret's um, account of territorial rights, which, again, is clear and sharp and simple and starts off with from a pretty simple baseline situation, which she then progressively complicates to make her point. So this map actually, oh, sorry, I apologize. So this map is the map of Bermuda from 1627. Yeah, so Margaret's argument about territorial rights is to say, look, um, there are all sorts of intricate conflicts around the world. Well, let, let's start from, from a clean slate. Bermuda doesn't have First Nations or Aboriginal peoples. There was nobody ever there before the uh, George Somerses at British English Admiral's ship capsized. At that point in time, the, um, the settlers have built fortifications and created a way of life for themselves. Therefore, surely they must have territorial rights. Now, Margaret is very sophisticated in her account, even though it starts from this very simple premise. So she says, well, um, settlement always doesn't occur all around the, the island. It, it, it occurs, as you can see, probably you can't see there, St. George Town in the um, eastern part of the island, you know, they have built some fortifications and they have built a township around it, and then they have extended one could say facetiously like mold, they have followed a certain lines along the main riverways, along, you know, follow geography, and, and they have settled the island in an uneven way. So at that point, she introduces a scenario. And uh, there are two scenarios where the, there is a Spanish ship arriving sometimes after, and the Spanish captain wants admittance in the society of, of you know, first, first Bermudans, uh, you know, probably George Somers was still alive. And the second scenario where Spanish want to settle as well. So, um, again, to simplify the argument, Margaret then offers a criterion of judging whose claim to, to, to occupancy is stronger. So, she says whether the location is central to the aims and projects and relationships of the group. And what I did in the manuscript, and I, I don't want to, it, it's too long. Well, I have, I have followed her mental example, and I have actually continued to imagine it, a dialogue between Somers 
and the captain of the Spanish ship. So very, very um, briefly, my point in that imaginary dialogue was that there is always there in the middle of there. So whether the location is central. So let's look at the St. George, the tiny little picture there. I'm not sure whether you can see it next to the uh, tower to the left. Whether the location is central to the aims and projects and the relationship of, of the group. So you could imagine um, Spanish captain saying, well, we, are, we, are, we want to settle on your island. There is plenty of empty space. And the, um, the Somers responding, well, you can't do that because we have made plans and projects to, to um, exercise our self-determination in this area. Then you can imagine, um, so you can't settle within the confines of St. George Town. And then the Spanish captain weaselly says, well, you know, we're not, we're going to look how much empty space is there between these houses there. So we are not going to be in your way. We are just going to build our settlements in a way so it doesn't disturb whatever projects you may have. And then the Somers responds, well, you can't do that. Then the Spanish captain says, well, you know, we will, we will settle outside of the of the city, and then Somers says, well, this has special spiritual significance for us because we have blah, blah, blah. Then Spanish captain says, well, actually, we are not going to uh, build on that exact place. We are going to move 200 meters away. All this to say that the so-called territorial rights are critically dependent on the way of seeing, quite literally. So they are. It's more easy to identify a space here if you have used a lens with extended exposition. If you have, if you have made a sequence of snapshots, you, what you would have seen are dots. You would have seen cars moving by, and you would see a dot here, a dot there, a dot there. You would see much more free and empty space. So, Depending on your visual apparatus, you can always say, and this, this actually goes all the way to the residency right, which normative theorists like to say, well, what about the right of residency? You can always say, well, you're not really using that bedroom, right? So what, 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 do, what, what do you need it for? Oh, your daily pattern within your apartment is such that you never go into that room. I promise to be super quiet. You don't seem to really care about it that much, what's the big deal? So, thesis number two. The vocabulary of territorial rights is a heuristic strategy that minimizes cognitive overload, that prevents us from getting into these conversations. Why do you need it for? Do you really need it for? Well, I'll, I'll just do this. So, in a way, it prevents the debate about the effectiveness, legitimate effectiveness, the level of care, the level of in emotional or whatever investment from going spinning out of hand. And that's fine. And that's perfectly fine. My point is only, then if that's the case, well then let's, let, let's call it that. And then let's say, well there are situations in which that makes sense, there are situations in which that doesn't make sense, there are situations in which the worry about cognitive overload bites you in the ass somewhere else in a concrete political conflict. So not saying, oh, there are no spaces, there are no uh, uh, territorial rights. They are a particular rhetorical strategy that brackets our way of seeing and takes it for granted, but which can always be politicized one way or another. Finally, oops. So going back to the problems. Underdetermined more than they admit. Um, on top of these, this balancing account that, that normative theorists put forward, one thing is not, in my mind, addressed squarely, even though Miller and, and Moore kind of, sort of, in passing mention it, which is that the third, powerful third parties, the exercise of their political judgment affects the normative content of the territorial right. Here is an example. Kosovo serves. And, 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 the architecture 
of the rights to self-determination allows that because there is always a provi proviso for capability and viability. So that's the, the opportunity for the whole vocabulary to be exploded into meaninglessness has been built in the very vocabulary of territorial rights. So let's just go back to, to here. Have the capacity to be self-governing. Does San Marino have the capacity to be self-governing? When Singapore seceded from Malaysia, they could satisfy 50% of their water supply. They relied on Malaysia on the other half. Would they have been viable if Malaysians have turned the tap? In Kosovo, for example, enclaves. You could say, well, blah, 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 they have invested, cultivated the land. Well, you know, there are 20,000 of them. West Berlin, for God's sake. So, you know, are they viable? Well, whether they are viable will depend on whether K4 in 2009 will prevent Kosovo Albanian authorities from cutting down the um, telecom signals and turning off the electricity, which, according to the Kosovo government, it's not about self-determination, it's just they're not paying their bills, right? They're, they're free riders and they need to respect, you know, sorry about that, it's a private law intercourse and we, uh, we are just enforcing the law. So, if they can't communicate amongst each other, if they can't, if they can't, if they don't have electricity, then obviously they are not viable. What is the duty, normative moral duty of K4 in that case? So Muller, Miller and Ward say, well, in that case, uh, there are third-party duties to help communities, you know, achieve their self-determination, which kind of goes a tiny little step towards alleviating this problem, but it's so underdetermined if we continue to operate with the vocabulary of popular sovereignty, where it's completely within the purview of the United States government to decide whether or not they want to risk the lives of their soldiers in a mission abroad, and not to get on the bad side of the Kosovo Albanian government. So do Kosovo Serbs have in those enclaves, do they have territorial rights? Well, it depends on, on the judgment call of the, secu of the uh, officer at the desk in the State Department basically, if you allow me to put it politically. Um, secondly, they don't work when they should. So normative theories, both non-statist and statist, remain silent, have absolutely nothing to say about the conflict in Ukraine. And I mean, Boris will, will, will correct me, what nation is there, or over the last 20, 30, 50 years, was there in Luhansk and, and Donetsk and Donbass? 30% of them identify as Soviet. They speak both languages. 90% of them have actually, and that's the irony or the interesting thing, have voted for Ukrainian independence in 1991. What mobilized them was not their burning desire to practice their national culture, because if the closest thing to national culture is their Soviet heritage and the memory of, of the Great Patriotic War. What mobilized them and turned them into a so-called nation is their indignation at the pro-Nazi uh, displays during the Ukrainian Revolution, at which point they probably said, we don't, we don't want to have anything to do with these guys. Are they a nation? What's the role of culture in all of that? So, to my mind, normative theory just, you know, remains silent, and there is no reason why it should remain silent, and, you know, doesn't speak about territorial solutions to that conflict, which are, to, in my mind, supremely legitimate, whatever you may think. Number three, they're not as useful as they profess. So, and I'll finish in five minutes or, or less. So, Again, particularly Muller, Miller and Moore say, well, we, we never said it can do everything. We just say that it can provide guidance, which helps us identify um, uh, heartlands. And when there is a particularly vexing and complex conflict, and that was Miller's argument in the article about Kashmir, then in that case, then what's, uh, what's called for is a system of power sharing. And then that should make you think, you have come up with all this theory to counsel power sharing, the stuff that 
theorists of consociational democracy have been saying for the last 40 years doesn't seem like a particularly useful contribution to me, especially in the context, like in the former Yugoslavia, again, huge caveat, there are probably a number of situations in which that this is called for and useful. But in the former Yugoslavia, the question was not what's my heartland and um, what's not my heartland. Heartland was never disputed. So in his wildest, heartland was disputed by people like Sheshul, who is a truly fringe figure, but heartlands were never disputed by people like Milosevic. So, so that or heartlands were not disputed by people like Tujman, who said, well, to me, this is the Serbian heartland. The Serbian heartland is Serbia, right? And from Milosevic, that included Ukraine. So they, the, the viciousness of the dispute was about the precise location of the boundaries and about the status of of the units, whether it's going to be a confederation, whether there is going to be a, a, a unit uh, territorial autonomy within an autonomy. So the configuration of different possible ways of resolving the conflict, that's where the, where the acrimony lied. Nobody, nobody had an issue with, uh, with the heartland. And my modest claim is there is a number of, there's a number of locations like that in the world, right? Um, four. And that's like a meta-theoretical white sugar corn syrup syndrome. That's, that's my invention. So normative theorists or normative theories, again, probably, I, I want to be clear, but then it's going to be perhaps too blunt. But normative theories don't care about Joe Schmo on the ground who is waging his struggle. So what they care about is providing the compelling guidelines which as when they are providing them they think about you and me and us and there is a huge amount of hair splitting what's not factored in is whether whether or even as a consideration imaginatively do we want to keep perpetuating certain imaginations of nationhood and territorial rights. So you could say, well, yeah, sure, we do, because we imagine that this is going to be useful if there is ever a court, and courts use the vocabulary of rights, so, you know, it's gonna come in handy. But what normative theorists don't take into account is that there won't be a court, and to dilute the nationalist imaginary of self-determination, and to say, no, 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 you are not, you don't, your rights, they're not trumps, they're prima facie claims, you need to balance. I think it's fair to say, or to ask, well, to what extent does that cut it? Especially if there are more elegant ways, and I'll skip that what these may be, about resolving territorial conflict. So you could say, well, I'm not claiming that I can offer guidance, and the rest should be dealt by historiographical inquiry. So we should, we should we're done with this, then we invite historians, and then historians help us disentangle the, the, the niceties and kind of complexities of these claims. Is this how nationalist contestation over territory takes place? Or do those on the ground come up with stuff? Come up with stuff, be in, are indignant as against what they see as other side come up and fabricating stuff. So there is an inherent risk that this vocabulary will simply amplify the sense of indignation, the sense of hurt, by by, ironically. So we're getting rid of the white sugar because it's of Trump, rights it's Trump because it's not healthy, but instead we are, we are using corn syrup as of prima facie rights that we then need to qualify with historiographical inquiry. And in the Balkans, so this is my bias, that that's a recipe for the disaster in the Balkans. So I'll stop here and thank you very much. <laughs>